Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we're going to be talking about what in many quarters is being called the assault by the United States and the West against the Chinese tech company Huawei. Now the immediate reason for this is because France has also announced that it will enact, enact measures by which Huawei's 5G equipment will soon be out of its systems. And this follows the United Kingdom, which last week announced a very similar measure. And we know that in May, the United States had announced strict measures against companies supplying equipment to Huawei. So we have Prabir Prakasa to talk more about this. Prabir, thank you so much for joining us. So first of all, uh, the move by France indicates that this is the UK's decision was not a one-off thing. There is clearly a concerted effort being made with all the Western countries as far as China and Huawei are concerned. So could you first maybe talk a bit about the kind of alignment that is developing on these lines? I think what you said is very clear that the NATO allies are slowly under pressure of the United States moving in the direction that they will stop using Huawei's equipment. Of course, there is a lot of Huawei equipment already in their network. So they probably have a time frame that by 27, 28, they will phase it out. Unless, of course, there are radical changes in the world at that time. So nothing, of course, can be considered as sacrosanct in terms of time in international politics. But given today, the direction seems to be the European Union is going to follow, or at least the NATO countries are going to follow the lead of the United States, keeping Huawei out of their telecom network, and probably working with the US to build an alliance of suppliers like Ericsson, Nokia, as well as Qualcomm in the United States for creating an, a, a global uh, opposition or a global alternative to Huawei. Of course, what is the role Samsung is going to play in this is not clear. Samsung is also a player in this, uh, in this space. So the 5G, 5G issue then has been thrown wide open and Huawei's technical lead, which is very clear in this area, they're at least 12 to 16, 18 months ahead of the others, is being challenged, not technologically, but through sanctions and by various trade measures. So it also makes clear, if you think back on it, that WTO, which would have been a platform where these sanctions could have been challenged, it has been rendered virtually defunct by the actions of the United States by not having uh, tribunal members uh, chosen and without tribunal members being available, that if there are not enough members in the, of the tribunal, dispute settlement tribunal, that means WTO effectively ceases to act as a trade body. It can say what it wants, but there is no way to resolve disputes. And the dispute settlement process was the key one which made WTO different from all other trade earlier uh, agreements. So I think now it also falls into place that this was planned for some time. Therefore, w, WTO dispute settlement body was made defunct by the United States. And now we are seeing a set of sanctions, which I do not remember ever having seen earlier. This nature of sanctions, that if I give you an equipment, and I'm the United States, I give you an equipment. If you machine anything on it, then that also comes under sanctions because it's touched my equipment. So this touch business of sanctions, that if you machine anything with my equipment, it also automatically comes under uh, my sanctions. This kind of legal extension of law far beyond the borders of the country is something that I do not remember seeing. And I do not think that it has any international a legal provenance in terms of international law. So this, it would seem to indicate this was quite some time in the offing, but the US had problems convincing its allies, but slowly, either by threat, cajoling, or by promise of money to their companies, slowly there is a move away from Huawei. And I think that is not going to get resolved unless the larger picture uh, falls in place, which is what is the role of the European Union going to be in this trade war. So that, I think, is the bigger issue. It's very clear that the United Kingdom, after living, uh, after Brexit, leaving the Euro Euro European Union, is going to march in tandem with the United States. But will the European Union follow suit? That was a key question. And France, if the indications are true, then France is giving the indication that it is also going to follow suit. 
Absolutely. So, Prabir, in this context, the key question really is uh, what are the challenges before Huawei and what are the options before Huawei? So, in an earlier conversation, we did talk about some of the technical aspects regarding the processors, regarding the semiconductors itself, and how the kind of challenges Huawei would face. So, could you maybe elaborate a bit more on this in terms of, uh, especially in the 5G sector, what are the most important constraints Huawei is going to face and what are the options it has in terms of overcoming them? Let's look at the other, other side of it, that if you look at the Huawei's range of goods, the mobile phones, of course, is a key element of that. And the second is the 5G network technology. It is one of the world's leaders in terms of telecom equipment. It supplies for networks, it supplies a whole range of equipment. And ZT is the sort of the laggard in the market, not as big or as advanced as Huawei, but it's also a cost-effective lower-end supplier of network equipment. Whatever happens to Huawei, I think also will happen to ZTE also. So this is where these two companies operate. So earlier, the ARM processor, which, was the, which is the key core processor, uh, ARM is a British company, which has been bought by Soft, uh, SoftBank in Japan. Now that operates out of the United Kingdom, but nevertheless, a lot of its intellectual property or designs, etc., come from the United States, from its offices. There are also some from the it links it had with the universities. So the U.S. has uh, earlier said that more than 25% of your ARM processors comes with our intellectual property. Therefore, that also comes under our sanctions. And ARM, based on that, had stopped supplying Huawei equipment or the core processors uh, from May onwards. It had said after May, we will not supply you any new designs. The ARM doesn't manufacture anything. It really supplies the design as software. And then, of course, it is converted into processors by companies. They also use the core process to construct their larger processors. They can have four to eight cores that go into such processes. And these are then fabricated in what are called fabs. The fabs in this particular case, which we are talking about, a Thai, is a Taiwanese fab company. It's a leading fab uh, company in the world. It has the largest income and the largest throughput, as well as the largest revenue. That has seven nanometer technology, so it's really the most advanced in terms of uh, fab uh, technology. And I think the only other uh, comparable fab that exists is probably Samsung's, which also have the cap capability of seven nanometer technology. So the Taiwanese uh, supplies to Huawei are now going to get hit because they will not be able to fabricate the Kirin processor, for example, which is built on the ARM core processors. Uh, that Kirin processor cannot be fabricated in the Taiwanese fab uh, company. So that, though officially they haven't declared anything, what we understand that whatever it is said publicly, they've stopped taking orders from Huawei. So they will probably still supply what they have built, made. And it is possible that Huawei has about 12 to 18 months of inventory of the processes they're looking for. So they're not going to be hit today, but down the line at some point, the core processes on which a number of technologies are built. It's not just the cell phone, which of course uses the Kirin processor, at least the more advanced ones do, but also a lot of the network computation that takes place, what are called the base stations, they are also processor based. So these Kirin processors would have been there also. So there is going to be a range of things that are going to be hit if they cannot access the seven nanometer technology. So this is the problem that uh, Huawei is going to face. Now, is this problem, an problem, problem really unsolvable? There are two ways of looking at it. One is the immediate solution. That means in China, they have the fifth largest fab foundry in the world, uh, which is capable of making 14 nanometer technology uh, processors, chips. And uh, that would, of course, be coarser than what uh, the Taiwanese camp company is offering or what Samsung can do. Therefore, it would be less efficient. It would be consuming more power. It would be more expensive in 
terms of computation because you need more equipment in order to reach the same computational speed, so to say, or computational effort. So yes, they would then have to balance it against the loss. But you know, the processor cost is not the major component of the cost. That's not going to be the major issue. But yes, the loss of efficiency and the larger computational uh, power it would draw, larger power it would draw would, would be in some sense restrictions. But don't forget that the competition largely in the 5G are based on processes which are Intel processors, and they're not as efficient as the ARM processors. So in that sense, that may not be an immediate issue, but long-term, yes, that they get frozen out of this market is something to worry about because Qualcomm, who also manufactures processors, and Samsung, who also manufacture processors, they are also on ARM processors, unlike Nokia and Ericsson, who are the, at the moment the main European competitor. So in the long in the in the long term sense, Huawei being hamstrung like this will have an effect unless they are able to de develop seven nanometer technology quickly. And for doing that, and this would really, uh, if they don't do it, this will also really affect their cell phone market as well because the Kirin processor is the one which they are banking on for the high end cell phone market. Right. So the question is, within twelve to eighteen months, can they do it? So now now they are importing. EUV technology. They're importing high-end lithographic equipment and they're trying to develop based on that the ability to bring the fab level from at least 14 to 10 or 7. Now can they do it in 12 to 18 months? We don't know. They can also import equipment which are not under sanctions because they are manufactured not in the United States but by some certain European companies, I think by also one Japanese company. Will they be able to do so? Not clear at this stage. Right. Will they be willing to supply the Chinese market given the trade war? We don't know. But the so Chinese have options over there, mm -hmm. but it's not that this is the only deciding issue on the issue on, on the question of 5G network. The other issue that's going to be there is that the major reason Huawei has an advantage over others is not because of the processor, but because of the gallium nitride material they have used extensively as opposed to silicon. And that has certain advantages because it actually takes uh, less power. It consumes less power for the same amount of comp computation it does. And gallium nitride as opposed to silicon seems to be giving them an advantage to the extent. For instance, this massive antennas, which are called MIMO antennas that are there, those antennas weigh a lot. So if they have to be lifted, put on a structure, and you require a huge number of them, because as you know, uh, the network distances have to be small. So the 5G networks really have not like the cell towers, they're not as dispersed in cell towers, they have to be much closer together, which means also that you need many more antennas than you do for cell towers. So if you need if those antennas, which are, as I said, a very large number of them that needs to be deployed, have higher consumption for power, for instance, and way more, that is going to be economically something that goes against those suppliers. So that's one bottleneck they're going to have. And some indications are that the other companies' antennas weigh at least 60% more than the Huawei antennas. So they have a certain advantage over there. And the second part of it is, of course, that the efficiency of the radio networks is still seems to be better than their competition. Ericsson, Nokia are not in the same range. Qualcomm has good processors, has got certain things, but they don't. I don't think they provide the same range of equipment that Huawei does. They make a lot of the components of the 5G network. Samsung is another player. None of them have the reach and the breadth that Huawei has. Yes. And in that sense, the only competition of Huawei was Ericsson and uh, Nokia. So these two were the major competition who relatively are at least 18 to 24 months behind them. And they are not switching to gallium nitride as yet. So again, uh, Huawei has a lead on that. And let's not forget the patents. Huawei has more patents than Qualcomm or Ericsson or Nokia. And uh, if you take the 
patent as an indicator of what kind of strength tech tech strength the company has then whoever has a huge uh, tech strength over in terms of know how and a lot of them are based on gallium nitride and let's not forget 95% of the gallium is a rare earth material is from china so they are also sitting on the source material over there right. so as of now the technology balance is still even yes they have been hit but as far as the 5g market is concerned i don't think they have taken a decisive hit so the real issue is therefore the political one how to keep huawei out of markets particularly of the countries like the european union uk the united states australia but let's not forget this is not the big market in the world today the big market is china the big market is india the big market is rest of the world so therefore in trying to bring huawei down keeping them out of the market there is the converse part that is also there they are essentially hamstringing their own networks making it slower because huawei could make those networks much faster that means they are imposing a tax a cost on the consumers in terms of speed and throughput so this is one part of it and therefore it is going to slow down a whole range of technology applications which ride in top of which are planning to ride on top of the 5g network for instance advanced vehicle maneuvering uh, using uh, iot devices a whole range of things have been planned with the 5g network speeds in mind so that would be that would be harm and secondly they are giving an incentive for china to switch that means whatever market china lose the china loses they also the conversely the american equipment manufacturers also lose a market because they can't supply those equipment to china and a number of companies who want to also export to china then will think american equipment is poison by the fact that any time they can uh, put sanctions on me for doing my normal commercial activities and therefore should i be buying equipment for them so this is forcing china to become self reliant that's one part of it weakening the 5g speeds in a part of the world that us still dominates and c also could harm the future fab fab equipment manufacturing equipment in which the us still has a lead so all in all it's a mixed bag that that is there and i'm not sure that which way in the long term things will pan out but china's basic strength is a huge internal network it has it's in its 5g uh, plans and they are already going ahead with that are far larger than what the us is going to deploy so in terms of market it's about 7 to 10 times the size of the american market and if that is so then automatically the size of the market that huawei has gives them an advantage because their home market itself is so large so i think things are still very much out there but india and reliance have stole the job has been a joker in the pack where they have got they're getting the technology what is the 5g technology jio is proposing we don't know they have a 5g they have a 4g network was entirely built by samsung and samsung has a 10 year clause that uh, jio cannot enter networks network technology areas uh, for i think for 10 years so i think that will expire in about 2 to 3 years so what do they have in place of that is completely opaque at the moment the qualcomm has made some investments in reliance but it's a very small one it's only 97 million dollars so whether it's a qualcomm uh, geo lineup is there some other things in the offing that we don't know is it samsung is considering itself to be a partner of geo we don't really know any of these things but we do remember that when the reliance uh, chairman mukesh ambani in uh, in a conclave stood up and said to trump that i have a network in which there is no chinese equipment right. we thought he was only doing some grandstanding but now it appears that there is a intention to switch sides or align with the united states there is an intention to actually align with the united states bring geo as a partner not just as a 
uh, recipient of other people's equipment, but as a partner, and maybe possibly enter the network erection, commissioning, uh, deployment market with other people's components. So we don't really know what the geo game is, but it is a certainly uh, emerging as a player, at least in right. terms of intent. And this, of course, means that the Indian market will also not be available to Huawei. It's very clear after the kind of bans on technology and the kinds of bans they have put on Chinese investments. Right. Right. So I think that is the other part that we have also to see. Thank you so much, Prabhu, for talking to us. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching your school. Thank you.